Thank you very much, um, Michelle. So um, welcome everyone. Thank you for joining this particular presentation. I'm going to share my screen and we'll introduce ourselves. So my name is Tashana Samuel. I'm a principal investigator on this project. I'm an assistant professor of psychology at Gutman Community College. And Sebastian is my co-PI. Sebastian, can you introduce yourself? Yeah, hi everyone. Uh, uh, I'm, uh, I'm also faculty at, uh, at Gutman Community College in, uh, in the City University of, of New York. So uh, I hope you enjoyed the session. Okay, great. So the title of our presentation is Reducing Math Anxiety with a Mindfulness and Growth Mindset Approach, MAGMA. Okay, so let's get started. Okay. So let's begin by re resetting the energy. Okay, I would like for you to begin by taking three deep breaths. Okay, so let's close our eyes and let's breathe in. And breathe out, breathe in, and breathe out. And one more time, let's breathe in, and breathe out. Good, so we reset the energy, okay? Um, so let's um, begin by giving some facts about our college and about our, about us. So this is Gutman Community College, which is in the heart of Times Square in New York City. And Sebastian, oh, sorry. So let's uh, give the land acknowledgement to Lenapa Hulking. So this time we would like to acknowledge the land on which our building stands. The land on which our building Gutman Community College stands is Lenape Hoking on stolen territory of the Lenape people. Lenape Hoking is in the island of Manhattan, the Dutch version of a Lenape place name translated from Lenape meaning island of many hills. The word Lenape means original people, thus the Lenape are the original New Yorkers. We recognize these indigenous people their displacement, dispossession, and continued presence. We pay respect to Lenape people's past, present, and future in the homeland and throughout the Lenape diaspora. So Sebastian, you would like to talk about our school? Yeah, yeah, for sure. So as uh, Tashana said, we, um, we are located in the in the in the heart of New York City, in, in Manhattan, on uh, Bryant Park. Um, I don't know, uh, Marion. I don't know uh, where, where you're from, but uh, uh, <clears throat> um, and the the college was created about ten years ago with this idea. Uh, uh, to put together innovative practices and. Um, and and help to to for our students, and the goal was to uh, to do better in terms of uh, of graduation rate. So we're a small community college. Uh, oh, from Madrid, Spain. Very good. Uh, I, I love Madrid. I, I I grew up in France, so I I know Madrid. I spent quite a bit of time there. Uh, I don't know if you have the equivalent of community college in Spain, but uh, it's a two year two year program. So we, we are a, a small institution um, uh, with a, a thousand students. Uh, we've been in existence to, um, uh, for about 10 years, as I said, and uh, we've, we've had success in, uh, in the sense that uh, our graduation rate, three-year graduation rate is 43%, which is higher than the, the national average. And our goal basically now is to scale and uh, to do the things we do well at 1,000 students, to do them at uh, 3,000 and, uh, uh, and 5,000 students. Um, 
So, but, and, and the, as I said, uh, the way I see it is that the, the core of the model basically is based on uh, innovative, innovative uh, teaching practices and also a lot of help um, uh, for, for, and support for the, for the students. So I don't know if you want to, to add something, Tashana. But that's... No, that's, that's fine. <laughs> Thank you very much for um, describing our, our college and our campus and um, the makeup of our um, students and faculty body. Okay, so let's get started. Um, we're going to begin with an activity, uh, free write, free type for two minutes. So let's begin. I'm just admitting a few more people into the room. Okay, so let's take a moment and write or type in a Word doc about any general concerns or anxieties that come to your mind. Keep writing until time is up and do not make any corrections on your paper or screen. So you're writing about any general concerns or anxieties related to anything, could be personal, could be um, related to your, your work, could be related to school. Be as honest with yourself as possible as this will not be collected or shared. So let's um, start the clock for two minutes. So you're writing down any general concerns or anxieties. Okay, so I'm going to um, give you a definition of mindfulness. And mindfulness is the intense non judgmental attention and focus on the present moment. It involves awareness of bodily sensations such as heart rate, sweating, breathing, deep breathing, and meditation. And for the purpose of this session, we're going to focus on the deep breathing while being aware of your bodily sensations while be, being in the present moment. So anxiety and stress are natural responses when faced with a threat. So what do you do when stress levels are out of control? How can we manage to remain calm when these negative feelings arise? We breathe mindfully. Breathing is an involuntary reflex, but mindful deep breathing is conscious. Being aware of what's happening now reminds us that we are still alive. So even if you're injured or experiencing a panic attack, breathing mindfully is the one thing you can control. So I know this sounds very inspirational or even religious, but this is grounded in psychological science. So working memory is our cognitive system which holds information for a brief period. It's conscious, it represents our present experiences. So I'm speaking and you're listening, hopefully you're probably writing. If you're trying to memorize something, you're engaging your working memory. It's also called short-term memory because it has limited capacity 
and holds information for about 10 to 15 seconds. So according to research, anxiety and mindfulness both require the use of this cognitive system, working memory, but they both cannot coexist completely because mindful deep breathing is incompatible and disrupts anxiety. So when you're faced with a stressor or a problem, you can either choose to remain in a state of stress, causing it to escalate, or when faced with stress, choose to be mindful, which will cause the stress to diminish quickly. So on a personal note, I am a psychologist, but I know what anxiety, debilitating anxiety feels like, and mindfulness has helped me to manage stressful situations and these feelings of anxiety. I research anxiety and have used mindfulness in my classroom to help students reduce their math anxiety in my statistics courses. So I know this will be helpful for you. We have to trust the process and lean into it. So we are going to engage in another um, mindfulness and deep breathing exercise. And of course we know how to breathe, but um, I'm gonna teach you how to breathe mindfully. So we're going to look at this geometric image, okay? And this will help to pace ourselves when we breathe deeply. So while we are breathing in, pretend you are smelling a flower. And when we breathe out, pretend you are blowing on a leaf. So let's continue with this. Well, I would like for you to close your eyes and I'm going to guide you through a deep breathing exercise. So you can just imagine this geometric shape expanding and contracting. And so now we're gonna proceed with deep breathing. So let's breathe in. And out. And continue to breathe in. And out. Okay, start by settling into a comfortable position and allow your eyes to close. Begin by taking several long, slow, deep breaths, breathing in fully and exhaling fully. Breathe in through your nose and out through your nose or mouth. Allow your breath to find its own natural rhythm. Bring your full attention to noticing each in-breath as it enters your nostrils, travels down to your lungs and causes your belly to expand. And notice each out breath as your belly contracts and ear moves up through the lungs, back up through the nostrils or mouth. Invite your full attention to flow with your breath. Notice how the inhale is different from the exhale. You may experience the air as cool as it enters your nose and warm as you exhale. As you turn more deeply inward, begin to let go of noises around you. If you are distracted by sounds in the room, simply notice them and then bring your intention back to your breath. Simply breathe and as you breathe, not striving to change anything about your breath. Don't try to control your breath in any way. Observe and accept your experience in this moment without judgment, paying attention to each inhale and exhale. Now, if your mind wanders to thoughts, plans, or problems, simply notice your mind wandering. Watch the thought as it enters your awareness as neutrally as possible. Then practice letting go of the thought as if it were a leaf floating down a stream. In your mind, place each thought that arises on the leaf and watch as it floats out of sight down the stream. Then bring your attention back to your breath. Your breath is an anchor you can return to over and over again when you become distracted by thoughts. Notice when your mind has wandered. Observe the types of thoughts that hook or distract you. Noticing is the richest part of learning. With this knowledge, you can strengthen your ability to detach from thoughts and mindfully focus your awareness back on the qualities of your breath. Practice coming home to the breath with your full attention, watching the gentle rise of your stomach, 
on the in-breath and the relaxing, letting go on the out-breath. Allow yourself to be completely with your breath as it flows in and out. You might become distracted by pain or discomfort in your body or twitching or itching sensations that draw your attention away from the breath. You may also notice feelings arising, perhaps sadness or happiness, frustration or contentment. Acknowledge whatever comes up, including thoughts or stories about your experience. Simply notice where your mind went without judging it, pushing it away, clinging to it or wishing it were different and simply refocus your mind and guide your attention back to your breath. Breathe in and breathe out. Follow the air all the way in and all the way out. Mindfully be present moment by moment with your breath. If your mind wanders away from your breath, just notice without judging it, be it a thought, emotion, or sensation that hooks your attention and, guide, gent and gently guide your awareness back to your breathing. As this practice comes to an end, slowly allow your attention to expand and notice your entire body and then beyond your body to the room you are in. When you're ready, open your eyes and come back fully alert and awake. The breath is always with you as a refocusing tool to bring you back to the present moment. Set your intention to use this practice throughout your day to help cultivate and strengthen attention. So, let's have a brief uh, reflection and discussion about this. So I'll just um, put down these questions. So what are your thoughts about this exercise? How did this exercise help to manage your thoughts about the anxieties or concerns you wrote about? And how can, be, how can being in the present moment help in your daily life? So feel free to um, unmute and introduce yourself briefly if you wanna answer um, some of these questions. You wanna, maybe we could write the, the question, the other question short, like Tashana, like maybe we can write them in the- In the chat? In the chat, like- Yeah, especially- Oh, look, Marianne, she, she, uh... Yes, I'm here. Well, oh, I just okay. want to say that I'm a mindfulness instructor. So probably, um, I mean, it, it's better for other people who might be experiencing this for the first time. So I do it with my students. And this is why I was very interested in your presentation, because, you know, um, I mean, mindfulness and, well, what, what can I say that this works, that this is excellent? Right. that this is life transforming, that there is a before and after mindfulness practices. And just say, well, congratulations, because it was wonderful. I loved the image you were sharing. Right. And <laughs> well, it's the advantage of recording it, because it was very helpful. And sometimes it is not easy for students to enter these states, and especially if you do it in class. But I suppose this is what you are going to continue lecturing us on. So this is what I wanted to say. Thank you very much. Thank you, Marion. Uh, and you are correct that you know students tend to be very resistant to um, settling in and doing deep breathing, especially at the beginning of the class session. So we'll talk about the procedure, but. Um, but they, it grows on them, <laughs> you know? So um, over time they know that that's part of the culture of the classroom. And so uh, we'll talk more about, you know, the procedure and um, results of the research. Um, but there are definitely ben benefits um, to um, incorporating this in the classroom. Okay, so in the interest of time, I have to move quickly. Um, so um, I guess during the Q and A we can, um, you can share your thoughts. So let's move on to the second activity. And I want you to write in your very best handwriting the following paragraph, okay? You're going to write this, not type this, okay? Um, so I am a student at Central Middle School. 
I am in Ms. Henley's class, learning about different techniques scientists use to solve crimes. Today, I will learn about handwriting analysis and forgery. The quick brown fox jumped over the lazy dog. So in your best handwriting, just write this paragraph. You want to, to show it on the screen, maybe, Tashana? I don't know if people got everything. Like, um... Can you see the screen? Uh, Sebastian, can you see it? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so you have one more minute for this. Okay, so you wrote the paragraph with your very best handwriting. Now, we'd like for you to write the same paragraph. With your non-dominant hand, and you have two minutes to write this, okay? With your non-dominant hand, um, you'll write the same paragraph in your very best handwriting. Okay, so a few questions. What were you thinking about while doing this task? How difficult was the task for you? Did you use mindfulness and deep breathing to get through the task? How did that work for you? Um, and you know, if you want to um, chime in, I mean, we don't have many people in this presentation, but if you want to chime, chime in, go ahead. Um, last question is, I will not ask you to compare the two pieces of writing. What do you think was the real purpose of this activity? Or you can type your question or reflection in the chat and we'll, we'll um, talk about it. Well, oh, okay. So Avery says, um, I found it very difficult. So yes, it was a challenging task. Um, but how, how, what were you thinking? Oh, you didn't have a pen, okay, <laughs> Michelle. Um, <laughs> this is a challenging task. Um, but what were you thinking while you were writing with your non diamond 10? Honestly, I was thinking about how bad my writing is with my left hand. Okay. Um, and I kept wanting to like go back and erase it. I find when I try and write um, my best possible way, I'm consistently going back to erase what I've done to make it, I guess, look pretty. And with my non-dominant hand, um, you know, doing those um, motions, it was very difficult not being able to like go back because I know that going back to fix it, I would probably make it worse. Okay. Uh, were you 
thinking about mindfulness and deep breathing while you're getting through the task? Or did you think this was like a separate activity that had nothing to do with mindfulness? <laughs> Uh, I don't think it didn't have anything to do with mindfulness. I think it it's a great task that like allows you to think um, about using mindfulness during it. And um, I, I do try deep breathing and, you know, kind of clearing my head when I try and do tasks like this, but okay. um, just in general, um, I just, <laughs> I just don't like my writing. If I, um, if it's not, if it doesn't look good, um, that's when I feel like it's my head starts to keep going and I want to just erase it and start over. Okay. Okay. So you're all about correcting, uh, which is good because this is about the process. Wasn't, um, I wasn't interested in the product. Okay. Um, so I'm not asking you to share your writing at this point. Um, so it's good that you got through it. So did you finish the entire paragraph with your left hand or did no. you stop midway? I stop midway because it, it's almost like I get too frustrated. Um, okay. And I know I can write better with my right. So I, and then it, I, I don't know, I, I compare them myself, even though I know that wasn't the task. Right. Um, and then that just kind of is like, okay, well, I feel like I not necessarily failed, but didn't, you know, do the, I feel like I did the best I could, but it wasn't good enough, if that makes sense. Okay. So just think about how our students are processing, um, problems, um, it doesn't matter which class you're teaching. Just think about this from the student's perspective. You're giving them something challenging to do. Um, yes, uh, being aware of your mistakes is important, but if you constantly go back to correct um, and you don't see through, see the task through to the end, um, that can also, you know, um, penalize you in the sense that, you know, you're, you're submitting incomplete work. Um, so what, what's the saying that perfect is the enemy of good? You, you're trying to be perfect for the first, you know, couple of sentences, but you weren't able to finish the task, which is some, something that students um, tend to do too. So um, just think of um, the student's perspective and how they struggle with challenging problems and perhaps getting through to the end, even if they make mistakes, is important. They can always go back and, and correct and see, you know, where they went wrong. So that's, that's just a lesson in that. And also breathing while we're getting through a, a challenging problem is important. So let me move on. Um, I'm going to move on to giving you a definition for, okay, so we, we can reflect on these questions um, later. So in the interest of time, I'm going to move on. Um, reflecting on the two activities and how could mindfulness be helpful for the students you engage with every day. So during the Q&A session, if you want to Hashem, talk about, yeah. Hashem, I wanted to, to add something. So I don't okay. to, to give away what, what we're going to talk about, but okay. um, Avery, when, you know, when you were describing uh, your, your emotion, you were talking, you, you were, I'm just repeating your words, but you were using your words like, uh, I think I failed. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and so through this activity, we wanted to um, uh, to illustrate basically what a student might go through um, uh, when they when they when they do math or when they do something that they don't know how to do. And we, we'll talk about this uh, more. But I, I just wanted to to highlight that your your answer was almost perfect for. For, for what, what we're going what's to coming up next and also um reflecting on what you're going through now i felt frustrated that's that's still an emotion is valid you know and that is mindfulness mindfulness means being aware of what's going on in the moment and so yes the uh the task was frustrating it was frustrating for you and you, you couldn't help but trying to correct so you know you were still using mindfulness so mindfulness, mindfulness is not just about deep breathing that's the way to um, address any kinds of anxieties or just trying to get through the moment, but um, reflecting on uh, physiological arousal is uh, an important aspect of mindfulness. So you were practicing mindfulness as, um, in, with this frustrating activity. Um, this, fr this activity is frustrating for a reason um, <laughs> um, so that you can be aware of what's going on and perhaps use um, other parts, components of mindfulness to help alleviate that frustration and that anxiety. So now we're going to move on to growth mindset. And so this will um, um, address some of the concerns you had with 
doing a challenging task. So what is growth mindset? Well, first we have to define fixed mindsets, okay, growth versus fixed, but I'm going to define the fixed mindset for you. Um, and this refers to attributes um, and, um, sorry, attributes, uh, skills as an intrinsic personality characteristics. So if you say, I'm a math person or I'm not a math person, you're um, attributing math as a personality characteristic when it's really not, and we'll talk about that in a minute. I'm either good at it or not, whatever skill you are referring to. I don't wanna try that problem, it's too hard. So challenging problems are avoided by those with fixed mindsets. When I fail, I'm no good. Uh, when others succeed, I feel threatened. Tell me I'm smart or tell me this is wrong. I'm going to ask asterisk there because the student actually, um, you know, he answered a problem and came to me. The first thing he had, he told me was tell me this is wrong. So I was so disturbed by that, you know. Um, so that's another example. And my abilities determine my success. My abilities determine my success or my talent determines my success or my lack of talent. With growth mindset, growth mindset is the idea that skills can be learned through hard work, perseverance, open, people are open to criticism and also learning from mistakes. So some examples, I can learn anything I want to. This problem looks difficult, but I'll try it. If I try hard at this, I will do better. When I'm frustrated, I persevere. When I make mistakes, I will learn from them. When others succeed, I'm inspired. And my efforts and attitude determine my success. So we know that the most accomplished people in the world spend many hours honing and maintaining their craft. So even if they seem to have some kind of inherent ability, they spend many hours um, maintaining that craft. And you know, I'm referring to was it the 10,000 hours um, rule um, for you know, maintaining, perfecting uh, a craft, your craft. Um, so these usually students um, come into classrooms with fixed mindsets. Um, they usually believe that, and especially in math courses, that you need to have a natural talent for math. Either you're good at math or you're not good at math. They bring that into the classroom and then it's very difficult to teach them because they're just not open to learning. If they just resi resign themselves saying that, you know, th there's no use teaching them because they're not gonna learn it properly. Um, so they end up sab sabotaging their, their own success. Um, and I want to emphasize and remind you how powerful fixed mindsets are because words are powerful. Um, it's important that to note that fixed mindsets in students have been reinforced for many years, for some as early as elementary school, and it continues well into college. It also happens in different contexts. So not only in the classroom, but many times they've been reinforced by parents, by siblings, by their peers. You're just not a math person. So, you know, just try to get the D in the class just to pass, so just to move on to the next level or just to um, fulfill that requirement for your major. Um, so it's important to note that students have been ruminating on fixed mindset statements for many years. So we have to assist students with reversing and unlearning fixed mindsets into growth mindset ones. And it all starts with, the, with understanding the power of words and to make it repetitive for students so it can be ingrained in, in their brain, okay, that they are capable. So fixed mindsets can be detrimental to student learning it can seep and it can also seep into our subconscious as educated educators and even lead to implicit bias and favoring some students over others. Okay, so this is the difference between fixed and growth mindsets. And now reflecting on your success, you know, we're all successful folks here. Um, was your success an easy ride or a straightforward path? No, okay. It required a lot of hard work. Uh, we, a lot of us are familiar with this iceberg illusion, okay, where what people see is um, success, you know, they see acknowledgement, um, but what people don't see um, are all these things at the bottom, what it took to get there, 
you know, persistence, failure, sacrifice, disappointment, discipline, hard work, dedication, okay? And what people don't see is really what mind, growth mindset is about. So growth mindset um, is the bottom of the iceberg. So long-term success is a function of having a growth mindset. So this is what we want to um, instill in our students. So growth mindset is a supportive capabilities approach. Growth mindset focus, uh, focuses on ability and capability, not talent. That skills can be learned over time through efforts, struggle, perseverance, openness to feedback and accountability. Mistakes are not failures, but are learning opportunities. Um, acknowledgement for working hard until the end and parts answered correctly. Uh, we acknowledge the parts that are answered correctly, um, but then we'll, we'll help um, students by give them, giving them feedback on the parts that they answered incorrectly. And instructor words are powerful. So as you'll see in, um, as, part of our, our, as part of our intervention that um, we install students um, growth mindset statements. And this is something that we repeat every day for for our students before the class begins. Um, instructors set high expectations while also offering high support. So growth mindset is not just about the student. Um, you also have to tell students specific ways that you can help them. So that's a, an, uh, an important element of this approach that yes, students um, have to understand that hard work is important, the effort is important, um, being open to feedback is important, but then instructors have to be aware that their words are powerful, negative or positive, positive are powerful, and they should set up high expectations for their students and let students um, know very specific ways that you can help them, that you can assist them in their success. So um, remind them when office hours are. If you can offer a tutoring session, you know, that is um, a growth, that's part of the growth mindset um, principle. Okay. Can I can I add a few things, uh, Tashana? Sure, sure. Um, the, to to underscore the importance of this growth mindset, uh, um, it's for everyone. So I think the 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 way we've been presenting the um, the, the the lecture is that we, we implicitly I think we we have in mind that student who would struggle with an activity, right? But you know, we all gonna, gonna, we all gonna to struggle at one point in our life. And so when that moment happened, it's important to, to have that uh, my, mindset ready because um, uh, otherwise we might not be able to overcome the challenge. So it, I think people don't realize that even for the, 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 the bright students, it's important that they um, that they learn their skills, and I wanted to share like something more, more personal. Um, I have like a, a eight year old. I have three children, but I have like eight year old, and um, we had the, the parents teacher conference uh, last week, and uh, I mean the, the children are doing fine. They 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 they. they they're doing well in school, but one of them has a problem with writing. So it's like mechanically, actually the, the, the left hand writing would be a perfect example. Mm -hmm. he, he's struggling to write. And so I was going to, I was trying to, to train and, and to talk to him uh, about it. And um, it's important to, to, I think, to develop the, this, this growth mindset from, a, from an early age because I don't want him to to give up completely on the on the activity. I mean, it would be hard to to give up on writing completely. But um, so I, I just wanted to add that that um, this growth mindset is is uh, is for everyone basically, not just for the the the, the student who perform badly. And also, I just wanted to, to, I mean, I think Tashana will talk about that in, later in the, in the talk. But I think our contribution as researchers is that there's a lot of, of work that has been done both with mindfulness and both with growth mindset. 
And I think uh, what people have liked with our research or with our approach is that we show that when you combine both of them in a, in a classroom environment or in a learning environment, actually very, very positive. They, they tend to reinforce each other and very, very positive things happen. So I just wanted to, yeah. to say that. Yeah, that's good. Um, yeah, so in, in listening to this talk, it seems that this approach is math specific. It's math specific only because I use this in my stats classroom, but this can be used in any context. It can be used for any age. You know, if you're going on a job interview, that's a challenging, you know, setting and you want to get that job, but you know, you also have to build confidence in yourself. And so, um, you know, mindfulness will help you get through that and growth mindset will help you get through that as well. So this can be applied to any um, situation that seems to be challenging or has a reputation for being extremely difficult. So, um, no, that's a good point, um, Sebastian. Okay. So growth mindset is for proficient students too, not only for students who are struggling. What are some students or statements or behaviors that some proficient students display that could be problematic? First, they assume all their answers are correct, okay, without checking their work. Oh, well, see, not checking their work. They tend to disengage in the classroom. Um, studying less, not open to feedback or collaborating with their peers, not willing to work on problem sets, tend to be very chatty in class, you know, because they think they have it all together, okay? Um, let's see if there's anything else I have here. So most high achieving math students have adopted very rigid mindsets, rigid fixed mindsets. We don't want our top proficient students to coast and to rest on their intelligence. So growth mindset will help them persist in those occasional times they do face unexpected setbacks, such as a failed exam. Because right for our proficient students, you know, if they have um, encountered a, a challenging exam and say they fail the exam, it's very de devastating for them. Um, and they may process it as um, they're less intelligent. So that's a fixed mindset um, statement or a fixed mindset thought. But in having a, with having a growth mindset, even if they're proficient and they see that they have um, failed an exam, they will automatically look at the errors that they made. Maybe they applied a, misapplied the strategy several times. And that's why they failed that exam. Um, and once they, they see that that was the problem, they can quickly correct that in their mind and, you know, um, re-engage in the class and um, face the next exam without thinking that they are, they are less intelligent. So we don't focus on intelligence, we focus on um, acquiring skills through hard work. Um, and we, again, we also don't want our own implicit bias to seep in and ignore these students, assuming that they know the content and do not need help. Okay, so what are some ways we can reframe fixed mindset statements that students make. Um, and this, again, this can happen in any classroom. Um, so for example, you tried really hard on that problem even though it was difficult. It's okay to make mistakes so you can learn from them. Let's apply the strategy you just learned. You're certainly capable. Try checking the strategy you just used. Understanding this mistake will help you improve. You're not afraid of a challenge, I like that. You never gave up, even though it was hard. And let's try. This may take some time and effort, but you're capable of doing this problem. And in this class, we are training our brains to learn math or whatever skill um, they are learning at that moment. Um, it's important to encourage them to try and then praise them for trying and getting parts that they did get correctly. So it's like catching them being good, right? Um, and and um, acknowledging the correct parts. Be specific and give them examples of how you can help them succeed in your course. So for example, tutoring, office hour, perhaps extra credit for doing um, another problem set on their own, okay, things like that. So let's now discuss the mindfulness and growth mindset research at our college, Government Community College. So, 
math anxiety. Um, I began this research because um, I well, first I was a quantitative reasoning fellow at Kingsborough, and my um, fellowship there was to um, figure out why students were failing the developmental math courses several times in a row. And um, I was hired along with two other fellows, one from economics and one from earth and environmental sciences, we were PhD candidates at the time. And so we set up a workshop and I was just interested in the why, because I'm a psychologist, I'm a cognitive psychologist, so I'm always asking why. Uh, why is this behavior happening? And students were very candid with us. They even cursed during the, <laughs> the workshop. So they had a lot of negative associations with math. Um, and some of them would say that, you know, I had a very bad experience in elementary school. I tried, raise, I raised my hand to answer a question. The answer was incorrect. And the teacher said, oh, that's incorrect. Oh, you don't, or you don't know the answer, sit down or something like that. Some negative um, statements and these um, negative experiences carried, the, carried, they carried with them throughout their academic career into college, in the college classroom. Um, and this is why they develop a hatred for math or develop math anxiety. So I wanted to investigate this further. And when I um, got my position at Gutman, this is the main focus of my research. Um, I also had issues with students coming to me on the first day of teaching a stats class. On the first day, first few minutes of class, they will tell me, look, I know I'm going to fail your class. I'm not good at math. Um, I've never been good at math. So I, I was shocked because first of all, you didn't give me a chance. I know I'm a good professor, you know, I teach well, but also you're not giving yourself a chance and you just sabotage yourself, you know, for the entire semester. So I really wanted to investigate um, an intervention to help these students alleviate their math anxiety. So let's talk about math anxiety and the college student in general. So math anxiety refers to negative emotions associated with solving math problems. And in the United States, many students from elementary school to college suffer from math anxiety. So math anxiety could lead to loss of interest in math classes, poor exam grades, withdrawals from courses mid-semester, poor or failing course grades, and loss of interest in the STEM disciplines. So with this particular intervention that I'll be sharing with you in a minute, I know it's like, okay, what is the intervention? Um, we wanted to address math anxiety as an EDI and social justice issue. This is a social justice concern um, because if students cannot um, pass or be successful in their math courses, it prevents a lot of students, especially those um, in underrepresented um, populations to pursue um, careers in the STEM disciplines because the, the requirement for those um, majors are math heavy. Um, and so this particular approach of mindfulness and growth mindset approach is based on a successful pilot tested mixed methods study conducted in a year long stats class. Um, and this has been published. This is the, the citation with the other co PI on this project, Jared Warner. So it's been published in 2019. Um, and the results from this project, there was significant math anxiety reduction over the course of a year and math self-efficacy increase in statistics. So the current project that we'll be discussing is a replication of this pilot research on a larger scale. So we wanted to generalize um, the experiment um, across professors and across different STEM classes, not just one stats class. Okay, so here are some facts about um, math anxiety based on your psychological research. So typically when we think about math anxiety in students, we think about when students blank out when they are working on math problems, but that's only half the story. This blanking out is called execution anxiety. And this refers to anxiety associated when students are working on math problems. However, according to neuropsychological research, um, math anxiety occurs way before this happens, this execution anxiety happens. So simply anticipating a math situation is enough to induce that anxiety. So walking into a math classroom or waiting for a math class to begin online, um, a professor announcing um, 
the class at the beginning of lecture, uh, waiting for an exam to begin. These are all examples of anticipation anxiety or situational factors that induce negative thoughts and emotions in anticipation of a math situation. So according to the research, this anticipation anxiety is much higher and is sustained for a long period of time during the class session and it's enough to induce and sustain the execution anxiety. This causes students to blank out when they're actually working on math problems. So the anticipation anxiety is, um, is higher and contributes to that execution anxiety. It's also been found that math anxiety hurts. So the same brain region activated during pain is also activated when a high math anxious person is anticipating a math situation. And this brain region that's activated is the insula. So when you're experiencing pain, that brain region is activated. And when a student is anticipating a math situation and has this anticipation anxiety, that region of the brain is also activated. However, execution anxiety is um, activated in a different brain region and that's the right cortex and left hippocampal regions. And these are responsible for memory, um, learning and the management of cognitive tasks. But even though these are two Two, this is these are two examples of anxiety. They are separate and they're found in separate brain regions. So the recommendation by these researchers uh, was um, to design interventions that will alleviate the negative rumination during the anticipation phase. So if we reduce um, the anticipation anxiety, then that will also minimize the execution anxiety. Okay, so as Sebastian stated, um, our research is the first to combine uh, the mindfulness and growth mindset um, to be embedded in the classroom. Okay, so we in induce two effective psychological interventions um, and mindfulness and growth mindset has been embedded in classrooms before, you know, this is not new, but this research is the first to combine uh, both of them in the classroom um, to address both the anticipation anxiety and execution anxiety. Okay, so we want to decrease the physiological arousal at the beginning of the class, uh, beginning of the class by helping students decrease their heart rate, be aware of um, their mental state and awareness and use deep breathing as a tool and then um, over the course of the class, the class session, we will instill some principles of growth mindset. So this is how that played out. And um, so for the fall 2019 semester, this is the replication. Here are some sample characteristics. Five faculty participated from four um, different STEM courses and there were multiple sections, about 13 sections. There were about 153 students who participated um, in the study, and this is after attrition. Um, we had intervention groups and control groups, and the faculty participated in an eight-hour PD workshop in the summer, right before the fall semester began. And Sebastian, would you like to describe some of these um, activities that those professors um, engaged in? Sebastian, oh, he's probably, uh, the internet probably knocked out. Okay, so one, one um, activity that's, that professors engaged in during the, the summer workshop was recording the last orange on earth. So it was mindful eating and each faculty member uh, took a slice of an orange and had to experience it in a way they had never experienced it before. Not just shoveling the orange in their mouth, you know, as we all do when we're eating, you know, but savoring the taste and uh, smelling the orange and using all their senses to um, experience the orange. And then they shared their reflections um, and their reflections were quite vivid. So that's going to be in a separate paper um, about their experience um, with a lot of these tasks. And we also did uh, a mindful walking activity. So usually when we walk, um, you know, we're not really thinking about 
um, our walking. We're just trying to get from point A to point B. But um, the, the faculty member, faculty members and participants in this research um, were mindfully walking, be aware of each step. Also people watching um, and being aware of themselves in their environment. So now let's discuss the actual um, procedure. So I had developed this procedure in 2018, and this is when I was actually 2017, and then I tested it in 2018 um, as a pilot study, and then this was replicated in 2019. So how does this work? Okay, so there are several classes that were involved in the intervention. Okay, there were the intervention group or the experimental group. And on the first day of classes, um, we administered two surveys, an AMAS survey and an MZ survey. The AMAS is a math anxiety scale and the other is the MZs, which is the math anxiety, sorry, math, math self-efficacy scale. Okay, and the arrow just indicates time passing during a class session. So start beginning the, sec the second day of classes to alleviate anticipation anxiety at the start of each class, a professor who um, participated in the research rang a chime to announce the beginning of, beginning of class and um, facilitated a one minute deep breathing exercise. It's really 10 deep breaths, so that's about one minute. After which the students and the instructor, so the instructor is guiding the students through this, um, five positive affirmations about math. So we'll, I'll show you this in a, two slides down, but I just wanna get through the procedure and then I'll sh show you um, the actual affirmations that they said out loud with passion, okay? Even if the students didn't believe the positive affirmations or growth mindset statements. So after they said the five positive statements out loud, during the class session, Okay, the, the class proceeded as usual with the professor teaching the lecture. But during the class session, in order to eliminate or reduce the execution anxiety, the instructor emphasized effort. They reframed negative comments about math into growth mindset statements and offered ways that they could help them in that moment or maybe um, um, after class or during office hour or tutoring. They, they also reminded them to be engaged and focus on the pre present task and no red pens, okay, because um, students um, have negative associations with red and, and failure. So no red pens. Um, and then mid-semester, we distributed resource cards, one growth mindset card and one um, mindfulness card um, to reinforce these principles over the course of the semester. And on, well, during the last week of classes, we, administer the same surveys for students to fill out the math anxiety instrument and the math self-efficacy instrument. And this was in the effort to see if there was a change in, in math anxiety and math self-efficacy over the course of the semester. So we also had a control group. Oh, sorry, at the end of the, the semester, we had a focus group interview with students and one with faculty as well. So we also had control groups and the control groups were just class as usual. So there's no intervention. We also administered the same surveys at the beginning and at the end of the semester for comparison. And just letting you know this particular period um, at the beginning of class uh, with the deep breathing and then saying the five positive affirmations about math took about five to 10 minutes, not even 10 minutes. Um, so it didn't take much of class time. So this, so the professor will show a slide. Okay, now it's time to do our deep breathing. We'll do our 10 deep breaths. And here are the um, positive statements, the growth mindset statements um, developed by me and um, my colleague, Jared Warner. So for example, Professor Samuel believes I can understand today's lesson. So the instructor and, and the students are saying this out loud in class. Okay, um, well, of course, if it's my class, I'm saying Professor Samuel, they insert their name there. Um, oh, sorry, let me just admit people into the room. Okay. 
I am capable of understanding math. Today's lesson might be challenging, but I'm up for the challenge. I expect to make mistakes today and then learn from those mistakes. Math is beautiful or magical when I see how it all fits together. So students say this together as a chorus with the professor. They know this is supposed to happen every day as part of the class culture. And uh, whether they believe in these statements or not is um, not an issue. Um, but saying them is important because over time, is you have to trick your mind. Um, by saying growth mindset statements uh, and making it routine that you're saying it every class session, over time, your brain is going to believe this. And um, if you read the first paper, the um, focus group for the students, um, many students argue that um, that even though they sometimes they didn't want to say the growth mindset statements or they didn't believe the growth mindset statements over the course of the semester, it grew on them and then they started to believe in it, especially when it came down to um, answering problems um, for exams. Um, when negative thoughts would try to intrude, they would find a growth mindset statement that they would say in class to counteract it. Um, so uh, that was helpful. Okay, so some results, takeaways, and next steps. And I also have um, graphs for the results. Um, but again, for the interest of time, I don't want to uh, like review them specifically, but I think you have them in your, in your slides. So some results, takeaways, and next steps. So the results of this um, replication, the manuscript is almost done, um, should be published this year. Um, the mindfulness and growth mindset approach appears to be effective in reducing math anxiety overall and for vulnerable students over the course of the semester. So for female students and for first year students, which is good. Some takeaways, math anxiety, academic anxiety is a debilitating problem for many college students. A culture of care in the classroom is necessary for reducing academic anxiety. And so my um, argument is that this has to come from the professor or the instructor because again, these fixed mindsets have been reinforced in many different contexts for many years. And it has to start from the professor saying, look, I believe in you. I believe that you're capable. Um, and so sometimes a kind word can go very far in a student because um, a lot of students haven't heard positive um, comments coming from teachers. I'm going to say all teachers, but you know, a lot of them have negative experiences. And for me, um, as a researcher, I'm really taking the student's perspective because I've, I've you know, I'm calling a lot of, um, sorry, curating a lot of um, data coming from students. And so I sort of, I have to be a voice for them. Um, and so we have to encourage students. It has to come from us for them to, you know, build that confidence. And so when they are working on their exams, they can feel confident in completing them and um, believing that they have really acquired and not only acquired the skill, but mastered the skill. And some next, well, just one next step is to address reading and writing anxiety and take and students taking English and writing intensive courses. So again, this inter intervention is not math specific, even though um, it was used to address math anxiety, but it can be customized to address anxiety in courses that have a reputation for being extremely difficult. Okay, and that's it, thank you. Um, of course, I have to acknowledge um, funding. So I'd like to acknowledge the CUNY Community College Collaborative Pedagogical Research Grant, um, PSC CUNY Research Grants, Gutman Innovation Grant. I would like to thank my other co-PI, Jared Warner, who's now uh, at USC. And of course, the faculty and student participants. And thank you for um, coming to this talk. And um, for those of you who couldn't make it live, um, thanks for um, watching it offline. So thank you. And um, I think Sebastian has an issue with connect internet connectivity. So. Um, at this point, I would like to open up discussion for questions, thoughts, um, any comments? 
Actually, well, I was thank run out of you. time. <laughs> thank <laughs> you. It was awesome. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much. I was thinking, and then you mentioned it in your next step, because in my case, right. it's more with foreign language anxiety, what we're dealing with in right. our university. So I was, you know, thinking that this is going to be very, very useful. I don't know if you can share your study with us, the results of your study, or maybe I can email you to see if we can so I, I do have um, I do have some graphs here to show the actual. I thought I was going to run out of time, so um, so I can show. It's actually the next slide. Uh, so this was a mixed methods approach. Um, we analyzed the pre and post math anxiety surveys um, and and the self efficacy survey, but my focus was really on the math anxiety, and we had the student and faculty focus group interviews. So there was an overall reduction in math anxiety and we have medium to large effect sizes here. You know, I wouldn't even talk about this if this was like, you know, if we had small effect sizes. Um, so from the beginning of the semester to the end of the semester, comparing the control to the treatment groups, um, there was considerable math anxiety reduction. And then we looked at male versus female students. Um, Oh, the females are in blue. Okay. Um, yes, there was a significant math anxiety reduction. Um, with the red, this is not significant for males, but for females, it really helped. And this is important because um, you know, female students tend to struggle really because of you know, stereotype threat and other psychological issues, not necessarily because they have less math ability compared to their male counterparts. So it's more of a psychological thing, and this did help them tremendously, and this is a large effect size. And for um, when we compared first year to program of study students, the first year yeah. student had a considerable decrease in math anxiety. It's a medium to large effect size here. And I would like to also share, let's see if we have time. Yeah, it's up to four o'clock. Um, some student posts. It actually helped quite a bit because when I started, I just had so much anxiety and it's easier to manage and get through through and remembering that learning happens when you make mistakes. That's a growth mindset statement, yes, you know? <laughs> it's very calming to do the deep breathing, especially, hey, hold on, I have to move this. Um, especially on those stressful days, I found it to be useful. I wish more students could participate in this. I also say positive statements outside of class at work. I changed some of the wording, but it has helped me to be patient. And I'll share some of the faculty quotes. For my more challenging class, I found myself taking deep breaths in the stairwell on my way going down to the class. So that was helpful, helpful for me. I just think it came to be like another tool in my arsenal of things to use. I never felt it was a tool to control students. It was never about that. It was a good way for them to kind of settle and relax. And it also made them feel like I was concerned about their health because I was making sure that they didn't get too stressed out about making mistakes. It helped me develop another dimension of my relationship with students. And I think I have another one. This is the last one I have here. I actually thought that even the people who didn't participate, I think them being in the classroom, hearing it, some of them said they didn't want to be there during that part. I said, well, you don't have to participate, just wait for the minute or two. And then I felt like that was probably good for more reasons because they're at least hearing them, seeing them, even though they don't want to say them. I just feel it's highly probable that the intervention did, a, did have an impact, no matter if the student was participating or not. This is what I was going to ask. If it yeah. was easy to persuade the students when the positive affirmations were taking place, because I can imagine that some of my students, you know, probably be out of embarrassment or lack of self-confidence, because mm -hmm. sometimes this is the reason why they don't want to participate in these different activities. But this was my question. Was it difficult mm -hmm. to persuade students to participate? It, it can be difficult, especially, um, you know, given our population also at the beginning of the semester, they're not used to something like this. So you have to, you know, you have to keep pushing and, and just let them know this is what we do in, in my classroom. This is the culture of my classroom. There's some students who will intentionally come late to skip <laughs> the deep breathing and the growth mindset part. But over time, again, it grows on them. And plus when they see like maybe a handful of students saying these things, 
because a handful of them will, will be um, very committed to it and they will say them out loud um, or, and they will tell others, no, be quiet. No, this is quiet time, you know, <laughs> this is time to focus and, and do our mindfulness. And it's, very, it's a very serious time too. I really emphasize that. Um, and I had to make sure that during the training for the professors that, you know, they had that kind of um, serious tone you know, to treat this as, as very serious, a very serious thing. Because one thing about students is that if you try to do something new and if you don't believe in it, they'll pick it up, pick up on your body language um, and they just won't participate. They just won't because they see that you don't believe in it. So I, um, the, the Dean um, mm -hmm. of our school was trying to, I think she wants to encourage many, many professors to do this. But I would say that only for those who really believe in it and really want to do it, should do it. But if you don't feel as though this will work or if you get resistance and then you, you just don't uh, feel encouraged to continue, they should just stop because um, then it will defeat the whole purpose. You know, you can't, you can't say, you know, I, I believe in you, uh, but your body language is saying otherwise. So the students will pick up on that and um, will actually be, um, have the opposite effect. So. so it was voluntary for professors as well. Professors. Yeah, this, this was voluntary. Um, and they, the, the incentive that they got um, for participating was um, the eight hour PD session was paid and also um, acknowledgement from the Dean to put in their personnel file. You know, that's important, right? Um, and a lot of them wanted to do it because they really wanted to do it. They wanted to alleviate the math anxiety because they felt it was a burden in their class and was um, impeding their ability to teach. And that's why I started this research. Um, so they had um, uh, internal motivation to do it as well. So yeah, and that's, uh, I'm, I'm just, just happy about that. And you know, we're almost done with the papers. <laughs> I'm excited. Wow. Uh, Thank you. Is there anyone else? Um, anybody else want to join me? Okay. Well, I, I really hope that you enjoyed this. Um, yes. And yeah, you know, I, I, uh, we've, we've been, we've been on a tour last year. This is before the pandemic hit. <laughs> we did we went to the lily conference and it was in california and then we went to the oh i did this by myself but the, uh, the league for innovation conference and people are just like excited about this and they, they would like to incorporate this in their classrooms like but like they teach they're not just teaching math they're teaching different kinds of um topics other kinds of courses but they see the applicability of this particular research in their classrooms because you know, students experience academic anxiety, not just math anxiety, and this can help. You know, so, so it will be a pleasure also to invite you to uh, my university. So I hope we can keep in touch. Yeah, sure, sure. Oh, just... Let me put my um, email address in the chat because I yes, don't know if there's please. anywhere else, um, maybe on the Attendify platform, but I'm not sure. You know, if, um, so the first paper is online, the pilot study um, was is online. So if you want to read, read that and um, to get some in-depth information about this. The application is pretty much the same. The only thing that was different was uh, we distributed the, the mid-semester resource cards um, to reinforce um, the intervention of the course of the semester. And, but everything else was the same. So if you read the, the pilot study, uh, Samuel and Warner. But it's online, it's available yes, online. It's online, yep, yeah, and it's free. And, and Sebastian is helping me write up um, this uh, forthcoming paper. So um, I think that's about it. Um, thanks everyone, it's four o'clock. <laughs> And I hope you uh, can use this in your everyday life and enjoy the rest of your day. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you so much. This is awesome. Okay. Take care. Take care, everyone. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay.